Uh, well, good morning. Uh, my name is John. I'm the lead pastor, and as always, just so glad to see all of you guys. Uh, so uh, I'm super excited uh, for what we're going to talk about uh, this morning. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, this new command that Jesus gave us, uh, which says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Uh, and as we kind of jump into this, a uh, couple kind of just maybe things that are obvious in the room. Uh, and so if you've been around a little while, as we start to talk about this, uh, you might think, Man, this is something that we talk about a lot. <laughs> uh, if you've been around, this is something that you have probably heard us talk about this commandment before. And yeah, uh, th that, that is true. Uh, we are in a series right now talking about who we are as a church and what kind of is most core to us as a church family. And one of the reasons why we're talking about this again is because this is something that is absolutely at the core of who we are as a church uh, and is absolutely at the core of Scripture and is at the core of everything that Jesus did. And so we want to make sure we talk about it because of that. Uh, the other reason uh, we want to talk about this is because this is something that I find that every time we talk about it, it's just compelling. Uh, out of all the things that Scripture talks about, out of all the things that Jesus taught us, of all the things that Jesus commands us to do, this is one of those things that whenever we hear it, even if we're hearing it again or for the thousandth time, there's something about it that just kind of like rings true. There's something that's like, ah, that's, I, I need that. I need people that really love me. And not just love me, but like love me in the way that Jesus loves me. And I need to have more in my life where I am extending love in the way. And almost every time we talk about this, uh, I just see a lot of just kind of just smiles, for lack of a better term, a lot of like nodding heads of like, ah, that's, this is so good. This is like what I need. This is what our whole world needs. Uh, and then the other reason why we're talking about this again is because while it's good, why it's compelling, this, as kind of Tim was talking about earlier, is so hard to actually live out. It's so easy to read through this and be like, yeah, love one another. Like, I want to love other people. I want other people to love me. And then we walk out of the room and we have our to-do list and we have work tomorrow and school and we have all the things going on. And this is actually very, very difficult to actually live out and practice. Uh, and here's just a couple of the reasons why. It's because really loving other people it's time-consuming. Uh, it takes us really reprioritizing the way in which we're spending our time, spending our schedules to really make time for other people and for other people to take time for us. And I don't know about you, but I'm guessing that most of us, our highest commodity in life is not just all this free time that we're trying to figure out. How do we fill this up? We, we feel busy we feel stressed. There's a lot going on in life. And feeling like as, as important as relationships are, making time for them is really, really hard. Uh, the other thing that makes it tough is that relationships are messy. Uh, there's a couple uh, different resources that I want to point your way today. Uh, one is one of my absolute favorite books of all time, as you can see by how battered the book jacket is. Uh, it's by a guy named John Orberg, but it's worth it really just for the title. It said, everybody's normal until you get to know them, uh, which I think is so true. Uh, the idea of like, oh, I, I'm going to have a relationship, and like, we're going to get, I'm going to be in a small group, and I'm going to have friends, and then you get to know other people, and turns out other people can be kind of annoying. Uh, they can uh, not be as punctual as you would like them to be. Uh, they say some things, you're like, I don't know if I really like that, uh, and here's what Maybe you want to own or not own. Other people can be annoying, but here's what's also true, is other people, that as they start to spend more time with you, it, you might put up a great facade for a little while, and you might be able to put on a pretty good show that you're a pretty awesome person, and you are an awesome person. But there's some kind of, some quirks about you too. 
And those start to ring true. Uh, there's another uh, great John Orberg book uh, that's called I Would Like You a Lot More If You Were Like Me. Uh, and turns out a lot of other people see the world differently than how we do. And that just makes relationships just messy. Uh, also, relationships just take grace and forgiveness, kind of built in there. If, if you're going to be in especially a long-term relationship with someone, there's a lot of grace. There's a lot of us coming to them and saying, I, I need to ask you for forgiveness. There's a lot of us having to extend grace and forgiveness to them. And relationships are kind of all of that. But here's what we want to drive home is even with all of that, that relationships, the relationships that Jesus calls all of us to live in are absolutely worth it. They are some of the best parts of being alive. They are part of this eternal life that God has called us to. A huge part of it is the joy of being in relationships with other people. It's not easy. It's messy. It takes time, but it is absolutely worth it worth it. Uh, so I want to give us a little bit of an overview of why we think this is so important. And so I listed a bunch of scriptures in your program. We're going to go through kind of the biblical idea of why relationships are so key to this idea of following Jesus. And then we're going to practice uh, what we're going to talk about as far as relationships. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So here's kind of my big idea as we start to go through scripture. And that's that looking at kind of who we are as a church, we are want to follow Jesus. That is kind of what this whole thing is about, is we want to be a group of people that have made a decision that we are following Jesus, and hopefully we're following Jesus more and more with each day, with each year. We're just finding more ways of like, oh, that's another way in which I want to follow Jesus. And right next to that is this idea that you cannot follow Jesus alone. That this idea that we could follow Jesus, somehow I can be a Christian, I can kind of have this like religious thing going on in my heart, but somehow I can avoid really deep relationships is just not, if we're using Scripture as kind of our guide, is just not possible. Uh, so we're going to take a quick kind of tour through kind of the biblical landscape of that. And so it starts in uh, the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis 2. Uh, where if, if you know uh, kind of the beginning of the Bible, it's a poem, and it has this like refrain uh, where God creates something, and it's good. So he creates light, and it's good. He creates animals, it's good. He creates water, and it's good. And then there's kind of this like abrupt like er, in the poem where he says, and the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And so God creates man, and he realizes it's not good for this human being to be alone. He needs a helper. He needs someone else walking alongside of him. And this is maybe one of the biggest distinctions between makes what makes what we do as far as following Jesus different than what is happening in kind of the greater culture. Uh, because if you look at kind of like the American dream, the American dream is built on this idea of like, independence. That if I work hard enough, if I make enough money, then I can really get to the point where I don't need anybody anymore. I can just kind of take care of myself, and hopefully I'm a generous, loving person, so I will help other people. But as for me, I'm kind of fine. I don't need anybody. And the Bible kind of paints an incredibly different picture, and that's the idea of dependence, that we absolutely need other people. And the Bible would kind of paint this picture, that if you ever find yourself in a place where you're like, you know what, I'm kind of like self-reliant, I can do it by myself, that is actually like blinking yellow and red lights. That means you have a problem. And we need to all get to the point, we say, yeah, I need other people. I can't get through the day, I can't get through my life, I can't be who I'm supposed to be unless I have other people in my world. And from the very beginning, it paints this picture that we need. It is not good if we are walking through life alone. Uh, and this is important for kind of what we do, because this model of being with other people, as kind of, 
is part of God's original goal for how the world is supposed to be. So we talk about this idea sometimes uh, that in Genesis 1 and 2, we kind of see God's original plan. This is the way in which God wanted the world to be. And we see lots of great stuff in Genesis 1 and 2. We see a very good world that's getting better and expanding. We see a relationship between man and God where they have this great relationship with each other. Uh, You see that man can rest. It doesn't have to keep working and working, but you can take a whole day off and just rest in the idea of the Sabbath. And you see this idea of man being in partnership, dependence with one another. And that's kind of God's original big idea. And then you see in Genesis chapter 3 that the whole thing went wrong. We're like, you know what? I, I, I don't know if I want to choose that way. I don't know if I want to choose to follow God and trust him. I don't really know if I want to be in partnership with other people. It seems like it'd be more important to be in charge of other people. It seems like it'd be more charge if like I was more important than other people. Like that doesn't seem great. I don't know if I have time to rest. I got to keep working and working and working. And it's kind of God's original plan got broken. And then ever since then, God has been trying to give us answers of how we get back to God's original plan. This is our idea of what the gospel is. The gospel is good news about how we can get back to God's original plan. And so as from the rest of Scripture, starting in Genesis 3, you see God trying to push us forward to how we can get back to that original idea of being in partnership with both God and people. Uh, it's over and over this idea of what I want you to be, my goal for you, is I want you to love God, And I want you to love people. And those two are absolutely connected. Uh, And you see this kind of all throughout. Uh, So uh, first pit stop then is in the Ten Commandments. And so the nation of Israel is kind of going throughout their story. Uh, A guy named Moses led them out of Egypt, and he gives them kind of their first initial laws, rules. Here's how I want you to live. And it's interesting when you look through these laws, because you see there's ten, ten commandments. The first three are really about our relationship with God. Uh, I don't want you to have any other gods before me. I want you to trust me, make me alone. I don't want you to have any idols, and I don't want you to misuse my name. Very much about God wants us to behave in a way that really repairs and brings us together with a relationship with him. Ultra important. The fourth one is about the idea of bringing back the idea of rest, that we can rest with God and Sabbath. And so Out of the Ten Commandments, three about God, one about Sabbath, and then the next six all have to do not with our relationship with God, although it all kind of factors into a relationship with God. They are about, I want you to treat other people well. That's central to how I'm commanding you to live is the way in which you treat other people. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. And do not covet your neighbor's house. That all those things will break you away from community with other people. And my dream for you is that you can have a great relationship with me, no other gods before me, not in the idols, not misusing my name, resting and in great relationship with other people. Uh, Jesus uh, built on this in a really big way, again, this idea of just loving God and loving people. And so one day, uh, one of the Pharisees, who was kind of a religious group in Jesus' day, experts in the law, came to Jesus and said, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Uh, And so... By the law, he kind of meant the idea of kind of the whole first part of the Bible that we often call the Old Testament, but in that day they would have called the law and the prophets. And so in this would have been over 600, 614 different rules and laws. He said, okay, out of all of those, I mean, that's, that's a lot. I mean, if I'm going to... I got to start somewhere. I mean, to do all of them starting tomorrow is going to be pretty difficult. If I was going to prioritize which of these is really the most important to get me to the life that you, of God wants us to be to, uh, what's the most, what's the greatest commandment in all the law? And here's how Jesus responds to it. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Which I think the people in the audience would have said, whoa, 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 like, 
we asked you for like the greatest commandment, and so we were kind of looking for a singular answer here. And so this is the first. Like, wait a minute, I, 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 we don't want multiple answers. Wait, what, what is the single thing that kind of everything drives back to? And just say, I, I can't give you just one because it doesn't all go back to just one single command. I have to give you two. He said, and the second is like it, uh, as in equal to. Uh, the Greek word there is the, the idea of like, literally it has like the same weight to it. Like both these measure up to be the exact same repercussions. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law, all the kind of beginning parts of the Bible, and all of the prophets hang on these two commandments intricately together about loving God and loving people, uh, which I think makes a ton of sense. Uh, the way that I heard it uh, described once is the idea of if someone were to come to me and say, hey, hey, hey John, we talk about this like relationship idea. That sounds awesome. I, I, I'm in. I want to have a relationship with you. Uh, I would like to become really, really good friends with you. I would like to spend time with you. I would like to do dinners together. Uh, maybe we could go on a vacation together. That would be pretty fun. Like, I really like, I want to go deep. I really want to spend a lot of time with you. I want us to have a great relationship. But there's a bit of a caveat here, and you should know this going in. Uh, I, you seem awesome. I want to have a great relationship with you. Uh, your kids... Not so much. Uh, hey, honey, love you. Uh, your kids are a little bit annoying, okay? And so, like, if you don't mind, like, I want to have a great relationship with you, but, like, when we're together, like, can you just not talk about your kids? Like, I just don't want to hear those stories. And, like, when, when I come over to your house, if you can, like, get all your kids just stuff cleaned up. I don't want to see that stuff around. And, like, if your kids, like, come out, like, actually, don't even be surprised. Like, if you see me every once in a while saying, like, mean things to your kids, or if you see me, like, even, like, hurt your kids, just know, like, that has nothing to do with your and I relationship with John. Like, yeah, no, like, I totally, like, stole your daughter's bike. And, you know, but that's not, like, that's not against you. Like, you and I are fine. I just hate your kids. Or I, I treat your kids poorly. Or, like, I just don't want to do anything with your kids. Like, what? You can't do that. Like, you can't separate me from my kids. Like, we are a package deal. And, it, and actually, if you want to be someone who really has a great relationship with me, one of the things that you can do that will most kind of like be like, man, I love you. <laughs> like, you are one of my favorite people is if you love my kids. The, the people that like take time out of their day to like spend time with my kids, my, my friends that like know my kids' names, that celebrate my kids' birthdays, that when we get together, they say, hey, what's going on with Liam? And how'd that thing work out at school? Because I... I love those people. <laughs> because you love my kids, that means something to me. And I think for God, it's absolutely the same way. That for us to love him, we love his children. We love the other people around. And this is just over and over and over again. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, said it this way. He said, whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments... You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. So he's bringing it all, not even just two commands, just the one command. They all kind of go back to this idea of love your neighbor as yourself. Because here's the deal. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Uh, in another letter, uh, Paul was writing to a church in Galatia. Uh, and in this church, there was a lot of talk about, like, how do we know, like, who's really, like, inside? Like, how do we know, like, who's, like, the real church people? Who's the people that are, like, the real Christians? And who's kind of like, eh, you know, maybe, but they probably have, like, a few steps to go. And talked about this a little bit last week, a little weird to talk about circumcision. Um, but one of their big deals was circumcision, not a big deal for us. But for us, it might be, okay, all of us are included in church, but it's like the people who really know a lot about the Bible, 
Those are like the real Christians, and the rest of us are kind of like on the JV team, you know? Uh, the people who like serve and volunteer a bunch of church, like those are like the real Christchurch people, and the rest of us are like, yeah, we're, we're included, but like not, not really. Uh, and Paul's writing to this group trying to figure all of this out. He said, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, neither giant biblical knowledge or not as much biblical knowledge, uh, neither uh, giving lots of money away or just a little bit of money away, has any value. Just kind of a crazy statement. And he says the only thing that counts, which, wait a minute, it's, it's according to Paul, there is something that's like, this kind of like, makes you like a little bit of like, oh, you really get it. You've really moved towards what God wants you to be. That you've really kind of like captured what this whole thing is really about. There's one thing, according to Paul, that really makes even God be like, heck yes, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And here's what it is. He said, for in Christ Jesus, the circumcision as any, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. What really kind of makes it stand out is when someone has this faith in God and it expresses itself through loving other people. Uh, Paul made that same idea uh, clear in a letter he wrote to a church in uh, Corinth. You might have heard this before if you've been to a wedding. He said, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, so if I can, I can just speak in like the special language between God and I, you know, like when I pray, it's just kind of like, wow, that person has like a really great connection with God. If you have that, but you don't have love for other people, you're like a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal that you're annoying. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, and so like if I'm someone who like when I describe scripture, like I just have such interesting insights and I just like know so much, and even if I have this belief that God can do amazing things, so that that's great. But if you don't have love, I mean it really isn't anything. He said, if I could uh, give all I possess to the poor. And give over my body to hardship that I may boast. But I don't have love. I gain nothing. Which is kind of interesting. Because you would think if you're giving money away to the poor, you would be doing that out of love. But Paul's kind of creating a category that I think a lot of us can identify with. Where it's possible to do things. And they might seem like they're loving. But for you, it's really not. It's about obligation. It's about trying to impress other people. It's about trying to get a tax write-off. It's about trying to, like, earn some favor from God or from other people. He said, if you do it, but you're not doing it out of a spirit of love, you gain nothing. And then he talks specifically about what love is. That this is what we should be, is love is patient. And love is kind. And it does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. And central to how God wants us to be is to have that kind of love. To love one another with that patient, kind all of that kind of love. And it's messy, and it's time-consuming, but if we decide we're going to love each other in that way, it is absolutely worth it. Uh, So that's kind of like the biblical idea of like why love and loving other people is so central to loving God and loving people. Uh, Now I want to give a little bit of a chance to practice that. So uh, this is, uh, and we're working on kind of a new membership document, so here's the way we say it in our membership document. He says, we need each other. It's kind of central to who we are as a church. We need each other. The Christian life cannot be lived alone. We carry each other's burdens and joys, suffering and celebrating together. We sacrifice our time, talents, and treasures for the common good. And I want to take a moment just to like go over each of those three of suffering, celebrating, and sacrificing. So we're going to start with celebrating. So as a church... 
for us to love one another, for us to live out that commandment, what that looks like in like kind of real brass tacks on the ground is that we want to be a group of people who are celebrating each other. And here's the way we say it. Celebration is worship and thanks rolled into one. God is too good not to throw a party. Whether through nature, his written word, or changed lives, he has done so much that our lives ought to sing and celebrate him continually. Our celebration is all the richer when done together. And so as a church, we want to sing together. That's why we sing each week is to celebrate. We want to play and rest. That's why we do picnics and do fun things. We want to eat and dance. We want to host parties and give hospitality. And we want to encourage and express gratitude. Uh, So as we go through each of these, I want to do a little bit of crowd participation, and this is going to involve uh, a little bit of, I hope, appropriate risk. And so uh, I want to try to practice each of these things with this kind of little bit larger group of people, and we'll talk about how that looks on a smaller scale. So that last one, we want to encourage and express gratitude. And so I'm guessing that there's someone or some ones in this room who has something right now that they are celebrating. And maybe you're celebrating something really big. Uh, Maybe you just accomplished something at school or at work or in athletics or, you know, there's something big. Or maybe it's something small. Uh, Maybe you made a new recipe this week and it turned out great. Uh, Maybe your kids slept through the night last night. Uh, Maybe you had some sort of a small win. And we want to be the kind of a church where when someone has something that they are celebrating, they are not celebrating that that alone, but they are celebrating that in community. Uh, So I'm looking for one person to take a big risk and to share with us as a group what is something right now that you are currently celebrating? Could be big, could be small, and then we want to take just a moment to celebrate that thing with you. All right, so do I have someone willing to go out on a limb and let us know something that they are currently celebrating? What do you got, James? You were in a band? Yeah, I That's I, James gets to go out and fly to Phoenix to see us over. Let's just take a moment and let's celebrate that with James. That is awesome, man. That is so cool. Uh, all right, next one. This one's going to be a little bit riskier, but we, we can do this. Suffering. Uh, we want to be the kind of people who are suffering together and being there for one another in times of need. Whether it's as big as a crisis intervention or as small as cooking a meal. No one makes it through this life without a helping hand. It is the heart of Jesus for church to come together in times of need, even when life isn't falling apart. A little encouragement goes a long way. And so we want to be the kind of a church where we are praying for each other, where we share our pain, and where we cry with each other. Uh, And so I'm going to ask someone to go out on a big risk here, and I'm guessing that there's someone in the room who has something right now that's like a bit of a pain point. And again, maybe it's a really big pain point. Maybe it's just a little bit. Jimmy's already got it. And what we want to do is after you share, uh, Jimmy, uh, we just want to take a moment to pray for you because we don't want you to suffer alone. Uh, Jimmy, what's your pain right now, buddy? So Jimmy has family who lives in Israel, and uh, obviously with the situation over there, uh, we continue to pray for folks in Gaza and in Israel, and his sister wants to come home. Gotcha. Okay, let's take a moment, and let's, I'll pray out loud, and you guys can just kind of pray with me. Let's pray for Jimmy and his family. 
Uh, Jimmy, uh, God, we thank you so much for, for Jimmy. We thank you for his love for his family. And as they are in the midst, uh, along with so many others, in the midst of a war zone right now, where each day you don't know if you're going to be able to be safe walking through your own streets or not. We pray for safety. Uh, we pray for peace and a ceasefire to come to that region. We pray for Jimmy as he, we still don't have control. We want to be able to, I'm sure he would love to just go out there and take his sister home, but he doesn't have that power on his own. And so we just appeal to you. And as he sits in that uncertainty uh, and the pain of knowing that his sister is in a place of danger, along with the other uh, members of his family, we sit in that pain and that uncertainty with Jimmy. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, then the last one, uh, most risky of the three, uh, sacrificing. And so sacrificing is giving the best of who we are to make the church body the best it can be. As an individual before God, each of us has a unique and indispensable mix of time, talent, and treasure. Committing to one another fulfills God's mission for the church. Sacrificing together changes you as much as it changes the other person. Uh, so as a church, we want to be the kind of a church where we help meet each other's needs. When there's someone who has a need, if we have an ability to meet that need, we want to meet that need. We want to use our time and talents to serve the church family, and we want to give our time and money. Uh, so again, maybe there's someone uh, here today who you have a need. Uh, maybe you need someone to babysit your kids this next week. Uh, maybe you need some extra food. Maybe you need some money. Uh, maybe you have a piece of furniture that's too heavy for you to lift and you need someone else to help you move it from one place in your house to another. Uh, maybe you need someone to help you with your yard. I don't know. But you have something in your life and there's a part of you that's like, I can, maybe I can do it by myself and I, I kind of feel bad about asking other people to help me. Isn't it true? It's so much easier to help someone else than to ask for help ourselves. Uh, but is there someone that would be willing to risk enough to kind of let us know something that they currently need? And then there's an add-on to this one. Uh, I'm going to hope that if someone shares a need, then someone else or maybe someone's else will say, you know what, I got that. I'll meet that. Uh, I, I could write you that check. I'll help you move that furniture. Uh, I'll help you uh, dig that hole in your yard. I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll help you do that. So is there someone right now who's uh, willing to go out on a limb and let them, us know maybe something in their life that they need some help with right now? Yeah. And then that, that's next week, Jenna? Yeah. Did you, do you know certain days? Oh, yeah. Uh, so so uh, there's a newer attender to, uh, to our congregation, and they have a surgery next week. And so one of the things we like to do is when someone has some sort of a surgery, it's nice to have to not also, also have to take care of meals. And so uh, we want to be able to provide a meal uh, for them and their partner uh, as they're kind of recouping uh, from the surgery. So that's next week. Are there certain days, Jenna? All right, so we have October 11th, October 17th, October 19th, and we're looking for two. And so are there two people that would be willing to sign up to make a meal for this person? They can talk to Jenna on either October 11th, 17th, or 19th. So we have two people willing to make a meal for that person. Mary's got one, of course. Uh, uh, which one are you doing, the 11th, 17th, or 19th? 
All right, so one, one of those days. All right, I need one more person willing to make a meal. Night. Sue. But Sue's buying a gift card. Awesome. I love it. Very cool. Awesome. Way to go. Very cool. Uh, all right. Here's the idea. That is, I hope, awesome. And I truly believe if we were to go around, we could find something in each of those categories for every single one of us. You might have to think about it a little bit, but there's something for every single one of you that you are currently celebrating and you need to celebrate with other people. You have something in your life that you are suffering, and other people should know about it. And you have some sort of a need, and other people would like to help you. And so it's not practical for us to go around right now to every single person. That already took long enough. This isn't a great environment to do that. We need smaller environments where we really have a few people that know us well. So one of the questions we often ask when it comes to this idea of relationships uh, are these questions. If you've been around here, you've heard these before. But it's, do you have someone who knows the real you? Is there someone in your life that you might not even have to tell those things to? They just already know. They know what you're celebrating. They know what's going on in your life. They just, they're in your life enough to know. Is there someone who regularly prays for you? Do you know someone who's regularly just, you don't even have to ask them. They are just in your life enough. They're praying for you. Do you have someone who celebrates you? Uh, and do you have, does this person frequently encourage and challenge you? Do you have someone who loves you enough to, to push you towards hard and difficult things? Do you have someone you can share your questions and doubts with? And then in general, who is helping you flourish and who are uh, you helping to flourish? And every single one of us needs somebody or someone's like that in our life. And here's what we all know, is having someone like that in our life is not easy. It takes work, it takes effort, relationships are messy. But we want to push towards that. Uh, I want to read this quote. Uh, I read this quote, I think, every time we talk about relationships, uh, because I think one of the biggest stumbling blocks of why we don't often have those individuals in our lives uh, is because of this issue. So this is, again, from John Orper. He says, the requirement for true intimacy having someone like that in our life, is chunks of unhurried time. If you think you can fit deep community into the cracks of an overloaded schedule, think again. Wise people do not try to microwave friendships, parenting, or marriage. You cannot do community in a hurry. You can't listen in a hurry. You can't mourn in a hurry with those who mourn or rejoice in a hurry with those who rejoice. Many people lack great friends for simple reasons that they've never made pursuing community a high priority. And so what we want to encourage you to do is we want to encourage you to make relationships a high priority. And I know a lot of you are already doing that, but for us of who we are as a church, we think that's central to following Jesus is to not follow Jesus alone, which means we need to take steps to intentionally make time for other people. Uh, so as we end, I just kind of ask, and we're not going to have you answer out loud, but just for you to kind of reflect on, what is something that maybe, what does that look like over the next couple days, maybe hours or weeks, for you to move towards relationships? Maybe for some of you, it means when we get done with service here, going and just introducing yourself to someone and just learning someone's name. That could be a great start. Uh, maybe uh, you want to go to someone after service today and say, hey, like, I I've talked, we, like have a, we know each other a little bit. Like, what are you doing for lunch today? Well, what are you doing later this week? Could, could we find a time unhurried to get together and try to build our relationship a little bit deeper? Uh, maybe some of you need to join one of our community groups. Uh, maybe some of you are already in a community group, but you need to kind of be a little bit more committed to that group. Maybe some of you in that community group need to like kind of take off some of the armor that you've had around you and share a little bit more deeply about what's really going on. Ask for other things so that you can start to have those kind of relationships. Uh, and here's why it's so important. It's because if we're going to follow Jesus, this is what Jesus commanded. It's he wants us to love one another. And I realize that it's, it's time-consuming. It is. 
It's messy. It takes sacrifice and grace and forgiveness. But I promise you, it is absolutely worth it. And what an amazing thing for this group to more and more and more be the kind of a group where we're not just in rooms together. We don't just sing together. We're not just individually learning about Jesus together, as wonderful as that is. But we are a group of people who love each other. Uh, Let's pray. Uh, Jesus, thank you so much for the gift of community. Thank you so much for the other people that you have put around us in our lives. The other people that you have put around us in this room. Help us to prioritize relationships. Help us to prioritize loving other people. Uh, God, we want to live in the world that you originally created. And absolutely, we want to love you. And absolutely, we want to be connected with other people. Help us to listen and obey to maybe what you're putting on our hearts. Help us to share with some other people the ways in which we are celebrating in our lives and help us to celebrate the other people around us. Help us to be brave enough to ask other people for help and help us to take the time and the patience to get involved in other people's lives enough where we can know their pains and their hurts. And thank you for the gifts that you've given this church community and help us to use those for the benefit of each other, to serve and love each other. We love you so much. It's your name we pray. Amen. Uh, As we keep reflecting, let's stand up and let's sing this song together.